Hebrews chapter 13 verses 4 to 7. Again, Hebrews 13 verses 4 to 7. Marriage is held in honor among all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor I will forsake you, so that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Remember those who lead you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Marriage, money, and model. Isn't it a curious thing that the writer put marriage and money right after each other? One of the things that psychologists discovered was that in the top three, top three sources of conflict among marriage, marriages, on the top three, within the top three is money. Marriage and money are vital aspects of every believer's life. These were issues for the Jewish believers then, the letters recipients, Yet marriage and money are still relevant issues today. The author's point was about honoring marriage, which also meant, or the real point is, sexual purity. In today's world, many try to remove the moral standards when it comes to immorality. Others try to redefine it promoting same-gender marriages. But conversely, we must honor marriage according to what is biblical. In the beginning, we know that God created the heavens and the earth. And God created man in his image, male and female. And the marriage was made male and female for the purpose of God to fill the earth because only a man and a woman together has the power or given by God the power to procreate. You see, woman and woman cannot procreate. Man and man cannot procreate. Only male and female can procreate. So such is God's design. And I believe it is a dangerous thing to redefine it. Because if you redefine it, and more than half the population decided they'll get married to the same gender, there might come a time that other species of animals would overtake us or even control us. Can you imagine the dissipating population of humankind? Same gender marriages. But what we must do is to honor what is biblical. The author was not focusing on money on the second part of the text, but money and the love of it. Again, let me restate that. The author was not focusing on money per se, but the love of money. Now, please process that in your mind. It is the love of money that is evil. Money itself is a tool that we can use. Please process that carefully. Because some cannot process. Their minds are too lazy to process things. So they end up, they end up what? Going to their default setting, their cognitive biases, in just saying that money is evil. But if you look at it critically, it is the love of it. Believers must learn to work an honest living, even grow their resources. And we see that in the Bible, even in Proverbs, to grow the resources that God gave us. Yet, 
flee from greed. There is a difference between honestly working and engaging in business, in providing the services and products that people need. In fact, to become a blessing for others versus I am doing business for the sake of just money. Money, again, is a tool, not the end in itself. By the grace of God, the believer frees the heart of worry and desire for money. Yes, first free your heart of worry because that leads to the love of money. If you are so worried about our lack today, instead of trusting in the will of God, instead of asking wisdom from God, which clearly the Bible says, if you lack wisdom, ask from God. If you need money, ask wisdom from God. Some people think it's only money that you pray for from God. I pray more, James 1, to give me wisdom how to handle the crisis in my life. When I lack money, I pray, Lord, give me the wisdom, the right way of thinking about this. Who do I ask for wisdom? Who do I learn from? Because if I just use what I know, my stored knowledge, that is always limited. Thus, the desire to keep growing and learning. Now, the desire for money is also dangerous. I pray that when you engage in work, it is to add value to the people who hired you, whether it's government or private. We add value with our intelligence, our skills, and our efforts. And when, when we are paid for that, we can sleep well knowing that our motive was to offer the services in the best way possible. One of the subjects I teach is the philosophy of business. And um, one of the questions I ask for an essay is, why should a business exist? Why should a business exist? You see, if you just say to make money, then your business is very shallow and it's one of those who will struggle in competition. When there is strong competition, you will lose because your motive is just to make the profit. But if a business exists to serve the customer, the customer would be willing to pay you for the services they get. And if your mind is continuously in improving the lives of others, now there is a difference between just making a profit and contributing to the society you live in. So I say, who pays for your employees? It's not you, it's the customer. Without the customer, you cannot pay your employees. That is a side business. I'm just saying how you can learn not to love money if you are in business. If your heart is into impact, social impact, if your heart is into improving the lives of others, but if your heart is simply, let's sell this so we can make a profit, let's do this business, kasi malaki kita jan, then you're starting on the wrong foot. Believers must learn to live in this world without the love of money, yet work for it, for it is a tool. In Thessalonians, it also says that he who does not feed his own family is worse than an unbeliever. That is in Scripture. It's also there that Paul said, he who does not work, neither let him eat. That is in the Bible as well. So the love of money is something that we must remove from our hearts. The believers then may find inspiration from their leaders who taught them the word of God. Three things we see here. They taught the word of God. And uh, they were probably models of these two, marriage and money. They taught the word of God. They can defend the word of God. But they were also 
examples. Look at their conduct. Look at their behavior. And if you look at their behavior, and if the result is that, is within the context, what is it? Marriage and money. Then follow them. Let's go to the first M, marriage. Believers should honor marriage, which includes the marriage bed. Sex inside of marriage is a godly exercise. And I really made sure the word there is exercise. It is not just an activity, it is an exercise. If your lungs are not good, you won't last very long, right? So you have to have good lungs. It is good, it is godly, it is worthy of praise if husband and wife enjoy it. Now, the thing is, you have to learn to enjoy it because it is a blessed. It is blessed by God. The enjoyment of it is blessed by God himself. Do not be led to believe that the world knows more about sex than God. Oh, no, no, no. The beauty of two people getting married and then discovering sex among themselves and growing through the years and then learning to improve their performance and their giving of pleasure to one another. Take note, sex in marriage is more of what you give than what you get. If it is always about what you get, then you're still in the selfish mode an unchristian way of thinking. But if you are in marriage, exercising sex, you're always thinking about how much pleasure you can give rather than what you can take. That's why among singles, I would say the true man knows how to control himself, mind, emotion, and body. He can control that testosterone it means his mind and his soul is stronger than his physical urges. If he is not strong enough to resist his physical urges, then I say he is more animal than man. More animal than man. So do not engage in sexual activity outside of marriage. Marriage is dishonored with neglect. Neglect. So husbands and wives do not neglect one another. And I'd like to say do not use neglect as a weapon in marriage. You know when I say weapon, it's like this, very childish. Ah, oh, you made me feel that, I'll make you feel that too. Uh, that's weaponizing your emotions, and then you never end. Both of you never end, so the war doesn't stop. So what happens is the disintegration of intimacy. But rather, what we must think is, how can I pay attention? How can I make this person enjoy it more? Because she is my wife, or he is my husband. There should be no neglect. And this is supported by Paul's writing in the Corinthians. One time I asked a small group of married people, not here in another church. Here we had to break it in slowly because we have the false Maria Clara thinking here, thinking you are more holy if you don't talk about it. <laughs> you don't know your Bible. Do you know that some parts of the Old Testament were for adults only once upon a time? You just can't figure it out because it's written poetically. But if you study it carefully, you'll see, oh man, this is like a manual. It is in Scripture. So do not neglect. The other thing that dishonors marriage is adultery. Having sexual intercourse with somebody who is not your spouse. Well, Jesus heightened the the, the, well, the standard. He said, not only you not doing it, but just you thinking about it. You've already committed adultery. And another thing that dishonors marriage is premarital sex. So wait for the singles, wait. Preserve yourself. 
and that would be your greatest gift to one another in the name of the Lord. Do not follow the world's ways. If you are controlled by the culture because everybody is doing it, then I'll do it. Then you have a very weak mind. Yes, your mind is so weak that you have to go with the flow because you have no conviction. You have no biblical philosophy in you. So I say, my brothers and my sisters, let us get stronger spiritually. But why, 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 why should we honor the marriage bed? Uh, the writer said, God will judge the adulterers and fornicators. Uh, let's read verse 4. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So again, our application is enjoy sex within marriage in His name. Say no to extramarital sex. Just say no. No, you, you have already decided. So when that opportunity comes, you've made up your mind. You won't cross that. Because I already made up my mind. It's not going to happen. Because I'm firm in my decision already. To those of you who have not decided, have not decided in Christ to have a firm commitment there, when the opportunity comes, and I say to you, they do come, in the weirdest places and in the weirdest circumstances, how will you strengthen your position? How will you say no? If you just have to decide when the opportunity comes, then you might fall. Say no, and do not redefine it. Oh, isn't sex is about love and we love one another? Well, scripturally it says love is patient. Patient. You're not patient. I don't think you love one another. You see, if the ladies, if the man can't help himself, and he's saying, if you love me, you will say yes to my proposal, which is to have some sexual intimacy now. If he can uh, bargain with you quickly we, outside of marriage, how, how quickly he can do that to others, if he does not have self-control on you. Think that way, rather than, no, if I don't say yes, he might go to others. Then let him go. And lock the door and tell him, never come back. You insulted me. You challenged my virtue. Don't you ever show your face here again. You see, that man is more animal than man. True men have self-control. We are not mastered by anything. We are not mastered by sex. We are not mastered by alcohol. We are not mastered by drugs. Nothing. We master our minds and emotions. Men do that. Real men do that. The sissy does not have control. He has no self-discipline. Now, I'm giving to you a biblical perspective on manhood. The world is different. The world would say, the culture we live in would say, a real man has many women. That's what the world would say. But I say, those who really follow that are more like my goat, King George. Well, he's dead now because he had too much. When I say too much, literally, because when I gave him 20 female goats, my caretaker said, Kuya, kulang. Oh, what do you mean? Binabanata na poste, kuya, dagdaga natin. I said, okay, such an animal. So I gave him 30. Then the caretaker said, not enough, kuya. I gave him 40. And I thought we were okay at 40. And this high-breeded goat, which is taller than me when he stands up, so I gave him 60, and we stopped at 60. That was my mistake that caused his death. <laughs> a 
So men who can't control themselves are like my goat, King George. So when he died, of course I did not eat him. When I call him, he comes to me. So he's more like a dog to me. Oh, I'm sorry. Some people eat dogs. Uh, but not here, right? Men must have control. We are not animals. And if you need sexual release, then build a good relationship with your wife. Build that. She's an emotional being. Grant her joy. Married couples should grow in sexual intimacy through time. Both husband and wife should explore the adventure. It is an adventure. Explore the adventure. Singles should wait until they are married. And again, let me say it again, believers must reject the idea of sex outside of marriage. But please be careful. You know how it starts? It starts with just holding of the hand. And then it elevates. And then you don't know when to stop. You have to stop somewhere. No, until here only. Then nothing beyond. So that's for singles. For married couples, because we become so busy with responsibilities, so many responsibilities, so much time, uh, we, need, we lack time, so I would advise you, if it doesn't happen spontaneously with you, set a schedule, an appointment with one another, in which you must prepare mind and heart, emotion and body for that purpose. The fear of the Lord will help us overcome sexual temptations. You know, when you're being tempted, always remember God is watching. So, you know how uncomfortable it is when somebody else is watching? You just can't do it. So if you think God is watching, I mean, the eye in the sky is watching and zeroing in my position, who is far, who is far better than any satellite, then... The fear of God comes in, and I remember He is a consuming fire, and He will make me reap the consequences of my sin. Oh, God is good and forgiving, but He will allow things to play itself. I will bear the consequences of our actions. That's why we must be careful with our decisions. Thus, fear God. So, marriage, these were all simply reminders but every now and then, we all need to be reminded. So, uh, singles, when you're young, you often do a lot of foolish things. And yes, you are foolish at times. And I'd like to say, I was young once. It's a good thing. The fear of God was there. And the community was there. It's a community of Bible-believing believers. Now, there can be a community of but not necessarily believers who study the Word of God. They just hang out. But they call it a youth fellowship, but they just hang out. They don't know the Word of God. That kind of group is prone to a lot of temptation. We don't just hang out here. We study God's Word. We are willing to be accountable to each other. We're willing to listen to correction from one another. That is this community. We support one another, but we also correct one another. Next is money. The author instructed the readers to free themselves from the love of money. Instead, they should experience contentment in God. The Lord will not abandon them, and He is their helper. Let's read verses 5 and 6. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For He Himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what will man do to me? So the love of money is a dangerous thing for the soul. One must remove all desire of it. It does not mean 
that we do not make an honest living. It means to be free of greed and worry. Instead, trust God's will in all things. Something I learned, and this is what I share to my business partner, especially believers. And I say, when riches increase, let's not set our heart on that on it. In fact, if this is what we can afford, let's live at this lifestyle. Always lower, always lower. We do not make a flashing of wealth because that's how the world thinks. I don't know why we need to impress others with a display of wealth. It is unnecessary. If your motive is to offer the service for that business and you want to make it work, there's a different motive there than telling to everybody, hey, I'm already successful, I made it. That is unnecessary. If our audience is truly God, if we truly live for the glory of God, those things are unnecessary. Now, I'm not against you being presentable. I'm not against you investing in clothes or, or stuff that will make you look neat and clean and presentable. Not everybody is called to be John the Baptist. If you don't know that, just read what he wore. And he was the only one who wore like that in Israel during that time, even in Rome, unless they were barbarians. The love of money will lure people into acquiring money at the expense of their souls. What does that mean? Because you want to acquire money at the expense of your soul. Now you tell lies. You tell lies when you sell. You say half-truths instead of openly saying, this is the real situation. If you buy it, this. If you buy not, this. This is the real situation. And I like speaking with people like that. I like working with people like that, but when I sense there are half-truths here and there, I'm always reserved, always at a distance. I don't want to really let them in all the way, because those are dangerous people. Dangerous to their own souls, dangerous to you. And more dangerous if you copy them. And you know what they say with their practices? Well, business is business. Usually a justification for what? To cheat others. Ah. Desperation and greed may lead us to cheating and unfair deals. Unfair. But you see, business and work should never compete with our devotion to the Lord and his community. Oh, because we lack money or we need more money, we become so busy that we don't have time to gather in small groups. As Hebrews 10.25 says, that do not neglect the gathering and encourage one another. We forget that the community is God's blessing for our spiritual life, and we should be a blessing to the community as well. That's how it works in the name of Christ, that we are a family. We neglect that. And we just allow the tide to just carry us. What's the tide? And daming customers. So we just let the tide carry us, rather than say, yes, I will serve the customers, but however, these are the things I have to do. There's a franchise chain in the U.S. You can search that, but I don't want to mention the brand so that I don't sound like I'm promoting a brand because I don't even know these people, but they say they are believers. And you know what they do? They're closed on Sundays. <laughs> I said, what a crazy fast food, closed on Sundays. You see, I, I wouldn't even take it that far, but they took it that far, and they were asked why, and they said, we go to church. <laughs> I mean, the owners go to church, and you've got hundreds of branches of, of this this. Uh, chicken restaurant, chicken sandwich restaurant. But they are one of the best performing restaurants in the U.S., by the way, financially. Somehow the people get so angry they buy on Monday, you know, and then they have to buy immediately Friday because it's going to be closed. Uh, what do we choose? Oh, we choose that because it's going to be closed on Sunday. Somehow it worked. 
uh, amazingly. No, but some of us, if it only rains, I won't go to church. Oh, it's raining. I'd sleep more. Or growth group, my, my, it's an online growth group these days and you can't come. How hard it is to wake up and to flip it and your internet connection may be able to make it. You don't even try. Why, because you're busy? I'd like to compare my responsibilities versus any of you. Oh yeah, maybe 90% of you or only 10% of you are really more busy than me. And, I would, and most likely you would be still active in your growth groups. But you see, 90% will not be as busy as me, but they have many excuses. Busy. 24 hours, 8 hours sleep, 8 hours work or study. Where did the other 8 hours go? Where? Where? I mean, you can even participate in a growth group while working your washing machine. For the sake of money, God and the things of God is secondary. No way. God knows. That's my encouragement for you. God knows. Even if you say verbally God is first, your actions will show if God is first or not. Free yourself from the love of money. Trust, trust in the will of God. You know, the funny thing is, sometimes when you don't chase money and you pray for wisdom, you chase wisdom and you put God first, somehow it falls into place in His time. But if you're always desperate, you're always back to the test. You never move to the second level from the test. You're always in square one of the test to free yourself from the love of money. And you don't go to the next level, to the next level, to the next level because you never pass this. You're recycling the test here because you always struggle. <laughs> Where am I going to get the money? You see, I have this philosophy. If the money does not come, then I will work with what's here. If I will eat lugao or arroz caldo with a lot of malungay to be healthy, so because I have no money, then I'll take that. If there's no money for tuition fee, then I'll ask my children, let's work. Let's think of something. Let's work then I will have to accept what's there. But if I have to cheat, cheat God with his time, cheat many other things and not put him first, then I have a problem with the love of money. Do you know that this thing, because I'm a businessman, every day I have to lay down my heart to the Lord to free myself, to make sure, because it comes in very slowly. Very slowly. It comes when you're desperate and it comes when you have a lot. Actually, the best time is really when it's just right. But usually when you're here, both sides, it's dangerous. And lastly, model. The author instructed the readers to remember and to follow the example of the leaders who taught them the word of God. Most certainly they honored marriage and freed their hearts from loving money. Verse 7, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. I, I like this. You know what the author said? Concerning their behavior, what they're doing, what should you imitate? Their faith. Why? What they're doing is a result of their faith. If you just copy what they're doing, trying to discipline yourself just to copy it and not starting with faith, then you misunderstand. They live their lives by faith in God. They teach the word of God. They exhort others and they refute others as well. But what do we imitate? Their faith. 
You see, their faith states that what? The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Even if I lack money, I will not be afraid. Their faith says, God will never leave me nor forsake me. It doesn't mean that God will always give you money. It means He is there even in your suffering. That He is there. That what He gives you is just what you need, that trust and faith. So let us remember good leaders who teach God's Word. They honor marriage and free their hearts from the love of money. We must imitate their faith. They're not afraid. Their fear is with God. Does it mean they never were really tested of fear? No, I believe everybody's tested with fear and worry. Everybody's tested with greed, but they overcome it. And in the same way, we must strive to be good examples. And that is difficult. That is only by the grace of God. And in terms of leading others to Christ, leading growth groups, house churches, or even the eldership, deaconship, or, or being a pastor, we must free ourselves from the love of money. Our marriage must be honorable. And the... Uh, our hearts must be pure, worthy to be followed by the community. On the other hand, let me just state, let us not follow anyone whose lives exhibit sexual immorality, the love of money, and neglect teaching God's word. That is not worthy to be followed. Now, many of us in our past sinned, but when we came to Christ, then God changed our hearts and we became faithful to our marriage and we have managed our money carefully, then those people are worthy to be followed or those people can inspire our faith. It doesn't mean that one is perfect, should be perfect through and through. But at the present, and as far as we can remember, these leaders exercised Wisdom when it comes to money and their marriage. So a church should have leaders who preach the gospel and are good models and the community should follow their example. And if we are not that example, that's why it's a beauty of the community. You must have a group, a growth group where we learn from one another and we are corrected with, by one another so it doesn't get worse. You know what I'm saying? If we somehow see how you present your business is distasteful, if you're within my group, I'll tell you. I mean, you're, you're hard selling on me, man. If you do that, you're turning me away. You show me the benefits, but you show me what, first discover what I need. You don't just shove something to sell to me. Know what I need, so what you sell is a blessing to me, not forced upon me. And others don't understand that part of ethical business for a long time, because they allow the training of the world to overcome their minds. Marriage, money, and leadership modeling. When my wife heard the, the title, Marriage, Money, and Model, uh, is this a fashion model? I said, no. This is modeling Christianity and leadership. Of course, she was joking. So, Marriage, Money, and Modeling, I give to you my latest poem with the same title. God designed marriage for a purpose. But people can be so calloused. Their minds have become unruly, delving into things unholy. Sex inside marriage is godly. Let us keep the body holy, the body for the spouse solely, the Lord's blessing most assuredly. God despises adultery, another form of treachery. God will judge the fornicator, those who made themselves 
the traitor. Free self from the love of money. Don't lose faith and serenity. He'll never forsake his people. You'll find that in the Bible. Imitate the faith of leaders, those who are also your teachers, teachers and models of the word, faithful to the gospel they heard. All of us should preach the gospel to all the nations and peoples. Models of the word we should live. A model of faith we should give. Let's all rise and let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your reminders. Thank you, Lord, after understanding that Christ is superior to everything, even over Judaism. Teach us to have faith in him and faith in you through him. For without faith, it is impossible to please you. You do not seek for emotionalism, although it is something that may glorify you, but what you truly seek for is faith. That overwhelming conviction, our belief in the promises in Christ, that there is forgiveness in Christ of our sins, that there is a restoration, a relationship with the Father, a close relationship with the Father, and that you write your laws in our minds and hearts. You give us a new heart. You change our hearts. That's why once upon a time we don't like your word. Now you gave us a hunger and desire for it. And we find the freedom and the joy to learn, to understand. We are struck by many lessons. And our application is something that just happens because we want it. That is the work of your Holy Spirit, Lord, and the work of your word. Not of us, not of us. Because by ourselves, we don't do such things. We are impure and immoral. But through the word of God, in the spirit of God, in the name of Christ, you empower us. For that is grace your favor, and your power in us. May we, married people, held, hold the, our marriage in honor and the bed undefiled. May the singles wait and be patient. May all of us be careful how we handle money to use it properly, not for our own selfish desires, but to properly budget it and use it for your glory. Things that build, not things that waste. Teach us to give to your kingdom, to contribute, and teach us to be models of you. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning.